So it's the beggy on again, huh? How are you doing? Sal, it's so good to see you again after so long. I know we were just talking the other night and it was like we'd only spoken yesterday, which we literally did. Uh, but um, friendship is a universal creature that one cannot always rely on. But with people like you, you've always been there. And it's good to see you again, my friend. Well, I realised uh, that when we are together, we tend to laugh a lot, don't we? <laughs> Too much, if anything. Yeah, I don't know why, but we just always seem to be laughing at things. And so uh, that's a good therapy in itself. But let's let's go back for those people who don't know. And so there was one day, I think it has to be so the second half of 1982. And so we had just had a hit with Is It A Dream? And then in, in the corner at EMI, I see these young guys with funny hairstyles. And so you make a beeline for me, right? And you said to me, yeah. I've always wanted to meet you. And that's strange. And it turned out that I was living in Cricklewood at the time. You guys had a house rented in Cricklewood. And so it seems to me after that, we were more or less inseparable, right? Totally. We've been soulmates and friends for a very long time, 40 odd years. Isn't that, isn't that strange? Now, I think back to that kitchen in Cricklewood where Jez had the electronic drum set up and there was the keyboards and everything. You guys Needham were... Terrace. Needham you... Terrace, NW2. Well, you guys were so very serious about the music making. And I remember you went to Zappa and things like that, right? And so then when you came along with the, this single sleeve to show me of your new single that was going to be coming out in the new year. And it had these pictures of each of you and Jez and Nick. And I said, this looks like the Bay City Rollers. Are you sure this is the direction you want to go in? Uh, I, remember, I remember you said, it's very pop. Are you sure you want to put all the names under the photographs? And I said, yes, we're trading on our assets, darling. <laughs> that sounds about right. And of course you did. And look where it led you to. The other irony is there we were, uh, same record company all those years ago, and today we're on the same record company again with new stuff coming out. So your your next thing is Fish on Friday, right? Yes, the Fish on Friday album comes out in October on Cherry Red. And, uh, yeah, it's amazing to be stable mates with you again with Classics Nouveau after all these years. And I've got to tell you something. Last night I was talking to my dear friend Andy Partridge from XTC because we talk every Monday night for two and a half hours. Good, good. And, and I said about Art Nouveau, who was because he was asking me about the history of the band, and I said, well, the, the, the early incarnation was Art Nouveau. And he said... Oh, Classics Nouveau. And I said, no, no, Art Nouveau. And he said, oh, no, they opened for us. And he said, what was the name of the guy? Sal Solo. And I said, yep. And he said, he had a mirror on his guitar. And I said, no, his whole guitar was a mirror because it was made by Mick Sweeney. And that's the, the conversation we'd had only a little time before. And he remembered. So he asked me to say to you, hi. Yeah, I, I, I should connect with him one of these days, maybe soon, because strangely enough, I was watching a blog or something of his the other day. So I see he's got the same hairstyle as me now. And, oh, yeah. You yeah. could be brothers. <laughs> and uh, there, uh, yeah, I remember we played at the Lyceum, that's right. And um, I was doing an interview earlier today with uh, some radio guy, and he said to me, I see that you used to play with all these little big bands all the time. Who did you play with? And so I was like, yeah, well, Ultravox, uh, XDC, uh, Gary Glitter, you know, it goes on and on. You you were telling me that you uh, played with Fashion back in the day. That was a band that we all liked, right? Well, when you've got to use the term played with very carefully because that gives the impression that you were actually in the band. But we supported them. Um, right. And they, they were a band that it influenced, I know, you and a lot of other bands at the time, and in, in, influenced us a lot. And we were very fortunate enough to be given an opening slot for them in 1982, around the time I met you. 
Yeah. Well, in fact, uh, of course, their their big album was produced by our friend Zoice Zoice Behold. Behold, yeah. Does yeah, it, I saw Zoice a bit a little while ago. He came to one of these Stephen Wilson shows. Great producer. Yeah, yeah. I think I need to hook up with him now. We can hook up with everybody online like this. You should. Anyway, He'd let's love to talk to you. Yeah, let's get let's get back to the fish because when I was growing up, I used to have fish on Friday. <laughs> my, we all did. My mother used to go to the chippy and bring it back with it wrapped in newspaper. All my American friends would be horrified at the idea that we could have food wrapped in newspaper. But uh, tell tell us who that band is and how you got hooked up with them. Well, I think it might have been about eight years ago. I got an email from a guy called Frank Van Bogart, who lives in Belgium, and uh, he said, "Look, we've got this band. We've done a couple of albums." And we're doing a new record. We, would you mind playing on a track? Well, I, I get asked to do stuff all the time. I turn down a lot of stuff. Uh, and he sent me this track, which I quite liked, called Welcome. And um, I played on it. It got released. Then the next year, he contacted me and said, would you like to join the band? Well, I've got these new songs, and he sent them to me. And I quite liked them. He's a good he's a good producer and a good songwriter, and he runs his own business. He's got his own recording studio, done a lot of corporate work. Um, and so I, I joined eight years ago and been recording with them on and off all this time. And uh, that's where we're at now. My, my involvement has become more and more each time. Um, I'm, I'm singing some of the songs now, and I get, I, I've become more involved in the production of it. Um, and, and they're just very lovely people, and I enjoy being around them. And th I have to say, that's part of my ethos. I only work with people I like. play with a million people my goodness like every time uh, I see you in the states you're with uh, some different kind of uh, artist or band one of the ones you're with a lot it seems to be is Howard Jones I used to like his stuff back in the day as well you know that's very it, it was very indicative of that 80s synth sound wasn't it really well he was at the vanguard of pop synthesis um, I mean, obviously, people like Kraft were, were, were in the, uh, the back room doing stuff ahead of, of the curve. But the, the second wave was definitely Howard and Depeche Mode and people like that. And, and I know you, for, you, Classics experimented a lot with synthesizers. And you, you, I remember your Oberheim. You used to have an Oberheim um, in the studio all the time. Did you have a Prophet 10 as well? Was it a Prophet 10? We five? did. Uh, I, yeah, I think it was a 5. I think we had a Prophet yeah. 5. Because actually, yeah. one time I did a uh, I did a production with Stuart from uh, Kajiguga playing for uh, uh, I don't know if the word is really band. They were more like a duo, a girl singer and some guy that was signed to him yeah. or something. But that Prophet Five sound at the time was really something, wasn't it? You know, it was yeah. it was it was very much one of the uh, tonalities of the eighties. Well, it was defined very much on the Tin Drum album. Uh, by uh, Japan, because they pushed the envelope. They all the oscillators they put out a tune to make them sound um, obviously very uh, multi-tonal. Uh, but that's one of the reasons why that album and that synth stands out so much. Yeah, it's. Uh, I remember uh, being at gigs. Of course, back in those days, nothing. They they didn't tend to have memory, so you had to be able to program the synths from nothing. So I remember uh, every time we were doing a gig in some other country, the first thing was I'd have to go to the Prophet 5. And uh, I think we might have had some floppy disks or something like that. Um, but yeah. getting, getting all those sounds up, it's just amazing compared to today. Everything is just there on the computer, isn't it? So easy. Well, you, you were very much um, an experimenter, as I remember. You, you, I mean, you wrote the songs anyway, but you were always – you played the – the majority of the keyboards didn't you as well as singing and playing some guitar on stage yeah we uh we didn't really have a keyboard player in the early years and so it is funny to think back that i did play keyboards on stage um and then i also seem to remember we talked about cricklewood so i seem to remember that you played on some demos for our third album i don't quite know why that happened but i i think well, that I, had I, time, a little i tell you why it was 
Why I'll was tell it? you why it was. It was because we were always at Manchester Square and there was always that little um, demo room which was right. hallowed. It was like an extension of Abbey Road. And that guy was, what was his name? The engineer, the house engineer, little guy with a sort of, he used to wear a white coat sometimes. Yeah, he was kind of middle-aged, wasn't he? Uh, like, yeah. Uh, what was it, Ron, maybe? Ron, well-remembered. Ron, and we were all, we would share demo time in the studio. Yeah. And I think you may have asked me to make a contribution to something because maybe Mick wasn't available or you right. wanted some right. other kind of sound. Yeah. Uh, well, you're right, actually. That studio, of course, some days Duran would be in there, some days uh, somebody else. And so, yeah, it was, it was a good place for us because, of course, we didn't have to pay for it because it was EMI. And back well, in... I, think, I think everyone was in there. I think they put Sheena Easton. I think they might have even put Kate Bush in there initially. Yeah, it was because uh, studio time was so expensive in those days. And so uh, to be able to have free time to work, especially Duran, I remember they used to work out a lot of their songs in there, didn't they? Just by kind of jamming. So was, They were always in there, yeah. It was very important to them. And actually, when we had a hit with Is It a Dream, the funny part was we went in originally and recorded it as an instrumental in that studio. And yeah. then after we'd done the instrumental, I guess I was thinking, yeah, maybe this should have some words to it or something. <laughs> I remember it. I remember you playing me the demo. And the other the other thing, actually, as you're talking about experimenting with keyboards, is, of course, we used to have a vocoder keyboard. I'm sure you remember that. But where people, you normally used to use the vocoder to make robot voice, I had the thought, what if you put other things in there? And so I put a little old drum box into the vocoder, and that's the sound at the beginning of Is It Dream, where it's a you know, kind of rhythmic thing, is actually going through the vocoda. But uh, Brilliant. back in those days, you could do And then, of course, the Chapman stick appeared around that time, right? Uh, well, that came a bit later on. That was, <laughs> that was a very interestingly um, a, a carrot and stick scenario through after Limal went. Yeah, but I mean, the, the, the Chapman stick made its appearance and then you became the master of it because the first time I get heard of it was Shock the Monkey. Uh, that's Tony Levin, isn't it? Oh, yes, in a general. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tony, because I'd never knew about the instrument before that. And then Shock the Monkey comes along and I'm like, wow, what's that really rubbery, fluidy sort of bass thing going on there? Yeah. Yes, and the other one was um, I Don't Remember by Peter Gabriel. Da, 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 da. It was an octave uh, thing on the channel. So you're you're going to tell, you tell us how you got into it. Well, after Limal went from the band, we were looking for singers. And, you know, you were one of the, the names that came up. Maybe Sal should be the lead singer. Maybe David Grant should be the lead singer. Who, uh, you know, Junior Giscombe. We, all these names were being sort of mooted around. And, and I was, they did a pincer movement on me one night, the band. And they said, look, we've been talking and we think you should be the lead singer. And if you become the lead singer, we'll have a Chapman stick made for you and you can become the Chapman stick player and the lead singer. Wow. Uh, and so that's that was how a good I, incentive. I, so I did. That's what I did. I was kind of, you know, I, I was a bit spit fright, overfaced by it, but I thought, okay, look, here we go. We've got to take an opportunity here. You know, we'll either go down in blaze of glory or something good might come out of it. Yeah, I actually saw recently a clip somewhere of you singing Too Shy Shy, and I thought, well, it just sounds the same, really. It's just as good, you know? And well, thank so, you, Sal. Yeah, so, so you, you did a good job. I mean, to be honest, I think you probably could have done just as well as you were. <laughs> really. Well, hindsight is twenty twenty vision, isn't it? One never knows. We go, That's just the way the cookie crumbled, and um, we. Well, I'm a pragmatist. I had to get on with the job. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I see you're one of the big sisters these days. Last year, they came. my two daughters came to me and they said, we've got an idea for a band and you're going to be the ugly one. You're the ugly sister. That's good. <laughs> I like that. Of course, I said, oh, of course, darling, I'm in. Well, tell us all about it then. What's it like? What's happening with it? Um, well, um, it, we are recording an EP right now. Obviously, because I'm touring so much this summer, we've had to reschedule some stuff. Um, but we have some uh, gigs coming up in the autumn. We're opening for Marillion at the Roundhouse. And we've got a show in Birkenhead and a show in London. 
and then we've got some shows next year as well. Uh, and it's, uh, I have to say, being on stage with my daughters, it feels like flying. It really does. It's a what strange kind of feeling. It's, yeah, what kind of music yeah. is it? It's contemporary folk. They they write everything. I try to stay in the background as much as possible and not sort of get too uh, muddy the waters too much because they don't need my input. Um, it, there's just some finessing things like production and um, rehearsal detail that needs um, refining. That's the only thing. But in terms of writing and uh, recording, they're very capable. So they've written these amazing songs and they harmonize like siblings, which is always quite transcendental. And um, it's a joy. I'm very grateful and very lucky to be uh, doing that. So they're playing acoustic guitars, I presume. And they play acoustic guitars, ukuleles, and they sing, both sing. And what, so what are you playing in that combo? Double bass. In that Double way. bass. Oh, okay. Yeah. So is uh, there some kind of recordings coming, or is it too early for that? No, the um, EP is nearing um, finish, being finished, and that'll come out probably the beginning of the new year. I was just listening to it today. They were doing um, a few overdubs while I was in America, and they've done a great job on it. They're very fine songs. They're very um, uh, emotionally, they, they tug at the heartstrings, you know. It's so interesting, you know, that I think people pay a lot more attention to the message of a song than we ever thought. Because uh, the guy that was interviewing me earlier, he was going on about a song from the first classics album, and it's called Or A Movie. And mm -hmm. BP had also said he really always liked that song. But the, the, the DJ, he said to me, you know, I was a teenager at the time, and you seem to be in this song talking about being in a bed sit and the loneliness. And I thought, that's exactly, he's got it exactly. I was in my bed sit at that time <laughs> and being 20 yeah. something and you don't really know, uh, you know what your future is or whatever. You know, it's, yeah. it, it's so fascinating because when we become more um, adept and more experienced at music production so on it's easy to kind of sneer a bit at our amateur you know early recordings that seem so amateur and not really and painfully earnest as well painfully earnest yeah and, and and i don't know if i always understood why uh people like that stuff <laughs> but uh, now i've got a new perspective because um we were asked to do our favorite top five or something, you know, of, of old classic songs. And I found myself picking in my top five a single we had called Nasty Little Green Men that was like... I remember that, yeah. It was like a second single. And I, I think for kind of 30 years or more, I was ashamed of it. And now I think, actually, that was quite cool. That one. <laughs> for all kinds of reasons. But I, think, Very good. Oh, I wouldn't mind doing that one again now. You know, it's got, it's got some kind of appeal there. But uh, also the guy today was talking to me about rockets. So, yes. of course, you had an interesting experience with me, like a photo session for rockets when you were not really on the album, but they wanted famous people <laughs> to be associated with it. Well, it was a weird thing. There was a, it, <laughs> They were entrepreneurs. They were Italian entrepreneurs, weren't they? Yeah. Um, and Rockets was an established Italian band, but they wanted to relaunch it with a sort of more modern feel. So they got you involved, and they recruited a bunch of other sort of extraneous people, of one of which was me. And there was going to be some kind of performance. So I think they were cover covering all the exits before they even got going. That's the impression right, right. I got. Yeah, they had, one, nothing, and, they had one guy and from nothing, Funkadelic, didn't they? That's right. Yeah, they were great. Erwig <laughs> was the drummer. There was that, there was a guy called Erwig, French drummer, and he was a very sweet guy. He came over to visit me in the in London oh, uh, around that nice. time. Yeah. yeah. Well, so I've got to ask you. I've got to ask Sal. How does it feel to be sort of getting your, your toe back in the water of classics, Nivar? It feels very strange. You know, I really thought I was done with the music business so many years ago, and. Mm -hmm. 
every time you and me, you and I meet up every few years, and you tell me all your stories of all the people you're touring with and stuff like that, and I've enjoyed having a distance from it. And I think the hardest thing is for me now, um, having kind of been um, in, in the background, if you like, uh, for a long time now, is the idea of being spoken to like a celebrity or like something special. And okay. I just like to think of myself, well, I'm just an ordinary guy who happens to do music. I think I have not totally worked out yet how I want this to be because it's come as such a surprise. You know, three years ago, if you'd have said to me, I was ever going to do class, any of us, we were going to do Classics Nouveau again, I would say, no way. You know, why would we? Mm. But having done it, uh, the strange part is that we're all very proud of the album that we've done, that we've got coming out. Right. And part of the reason, I think, is we're not hampered by trends and fashions and things now like we were back in the day and unencumbered yeah yeah so we don't have to have limits upon ourselves like for instance uh in the 80s of course it was the time of the synth and so guitars were not really allowed to spread their wings no but uh we've always liked you know rock guitar all of us really and so on this album we've been able to let gary just do what he wants play what he wants to play uh, BP has just really gone crazy and I enjoy that because he used to be so powerful live and mm -hmm. didn't quite give him the freedom on the albums again everything was so robotic back then wasn't it you know well I, the thing is about BP I love his lineage because he was in X-Ray Specs with Polystyrene yes. and I love that stuff and I remember when I met you guys and telling him I love the, the day the world turned to day glow mm -hmm. all that stuff is really important it was seminal pump uh, punk stuff wasn't it he asked me one time if we could do a cover version of uh, germ free adolescence and uh, I, I was tempted because i like the song but then i thought no you can't really step in polystyrene's footsteps you know and so, well it could be an homage i don't think it's a bad idea well, well let's see what happens <laughs> <laughs> this, this is an A and R man speaking now. Well, I, I always, I always did like that song because I remember you see uh, when right at the beginning of Classics when we had Jack Airport in the band, and one of the first things I was thinking about was, of course, he came up with that uh, delay echo thing. Did, 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 so it was like a sequence, but it was really just a guitar chord. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I always thought that that was a great idea, and I'd love to do th things like that. And I think we did actually. Um, so the creativity there was fascinating. But something that BP said to me recently that I didn't really know, I hadn't thought about, he said, at the time we started, he'd only been playing drums a couple of years, he said, and just in a punk band, everything was simple. So yeah. in classics, he was kind of learning as we went along and he started to play these different rhythms and it really started to challenge him and stretch him because we do gigs... Uh, like with Ultravox or something, and of course they had great, great music, rhythms, everything. They, they'd had several albums already before Majura. And uh, so he was really soaking it in. So by the end, he was really a great drummer. I mean, we thought he was yeah. good at the start because he was very heavy, very powerful. Um, but he, I think that's why he uh, is very attached to classics because we kind of said to one another, isn't it weird? You know, we've all been in other bands, done other things. Why is it that we've gravitated back to classics? And mm -hmm. it just seems to feel right uh, for us, that's all. Uh, but I want to ask you, like, we talked about the uh, Chapman Stick, and so I know yeah. you did something Chapman Stick and Orchestra, which I'm really enthusiastic about. So tell us when we can expect maybe to uh, hear that. Well, um, like so many things, they, they're time-locked. And, and I'm, able, I'm only able to give so much time to a particular project. I was supposed to be um, doing mixes for that album and reamping stuff at the studio when suddenly I had to go on the road. So it's going to have to be rolled over now till next year. Um, I've got six, six albums which I'm working on at the minute. So um, between all of them, it's just basically plate spinning. 
Uh, that will come out, but it'll probably be next year now. But it's Chapman Stick and Orchestra, which was recorded at um, Studio One in Abbey Road. Did you write the stuff, or who wrote it? Um, I was the catalyst for the material. I wrote the top lines and the chordal progressions. But I w worked um, with a, an orchestrator called John Ashton Thomas, and then he threw a couple of additional compositions in as well, um, which I then um, extemporized over. Uh, unfortunately, before the, the finishing of the, re the record, he died. Wow. So we had to go into Abbey Road and record these incredible parts that he'd scored for this very emotional music in his absence with a different conductor. Um, so it's going to be an homage as well, you know. Mm, amazing. You know, probably one of the records that influenced me the most to want to do music was I Am The Walrus. And uh, so for me, Abbey Road orchestras, it's like the best, it's the, the greatest thing. So, uh, yeah, it's something very resonant to be in that room when you're listening to a 32 piece orchestra. It's, it's yeah, you, yeah. I, I cried, I just started crying from the down, the first down bat on. I, I, I just looked at uh, our uh, the, the, the record company guy, who's a guy called Andrew Sunnock sitting next to me, and I just I was crying, and he went, Oh. <laughs> it's very sweet. <laughs> Too soft to you. No, I, I know, oh, you know me. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean because on the third classics album, we had um, uh, on one of the songs we had Anne Dudley uh, bring an orchestra in, and it was so amazing. The engineer was Phil Thornalley, of course, who went on to oh, right. okay. do stuff, but he was only nineteen at the time, and he was brilliant. Mm -hmm. right? We exactly had a mic up into each instrument. And so I remember when we actually heard it, it was like, wow, you're in heaven, aren't you, when you hear <laughs> all of those sounds. Anyway, t tell us just before we uh, get to the end of this, like, what are you really looking forward to uh, coming up? Well, I, that's hard to put my finger on, Sal, because I've, I've, I kind of look forward to it all. Uh, I'm about to go um, back on the road with Howard Jones. We're going to Japan for a week to play some acoustic trio shows. And then we come back and I go back to Canada with Howard Jones to play more acoustic trio shows. And then we come back and we begin the October full electric band with Howard Jones, which will culminate in a show at the um, London Palladium. Then I start with the Beg Sisters. We'll be gigging and I'll be starting to mix my own projects for release next year. So there's always a very natural stepping stone of sequence uh, events happening and they're in my mind they're in my diary and i'm I, it just feels like you know i turn from one thing to the other i've got them all laid out in front of me and ready to go and i just pick them up as they go well you have to keep us informed as, of everything that's coming out and now we've got this whole uh fan <laughs> fan, fan box thing going again then uh we'll have to tell them of course uh, we've got a lot of fans in Poland, and as I know back in the day, you were in Poland, so they'll all be very interested to know what you're doing now. So, uh, Yeah, well, we should do this again because, you know, we can drill down into some real minutiae and some real fan base stuff and the history of it all and just talk uh, ad nauseum about our relationship, which I think is always a lot of fun. Good to catch up, Sal, and see you. Absolutely. All right, then, we'll tell all the fans to look look out for you. Fish on Friday and the Big Sisters and then the rest to come, right? And Classics Nouveau's new album. Mm -hmm.